So there are ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all of you who are following us uh, on this uh, online roundtable on Europe's need for more plasma before, during and uh, after COVID-19. Although I cannot uh, welcome you in person at the European Parliament as I would have liked, uh, it's a pleasure for me to host this online meeting with my colleague uh, Cesar Luena on uh, such a, a crucial um, topic. Uh, the discussion today is timely. The COVID-19 pandemic has amplified the need for more Europe in health matter in general, let me say. It has become even more evident that uh, even though we are part of a globalized world, we need to invest more for a stronger European autonomy when it comes to crucial medical devices uh, or active pharmaceutical ingredients. Uh, during the round table, and uh, I want to thank uh, our speakers uh, who agreed to share with us their views today. Uh, during this round table, we will see how this applies to a critical starting materials uh, such as plasma. Uh, the demand for plasma derived uh, medicinal products uh, have been growing significantly uh, through the years. As you know, PD and PS are essential for a number of treatments and rare diseases. I'm referring, I'm referring to life-saving medicines for patients with rare and often genetic conditions uh, such as primary immunodeficiencies and uh, hemophilia. However, numbers show us that in Europe, we are still not collecting enough plasma to meet these patient needs uh, and consequently, we must depend on plasma imports, mainly from the US. Uh, the EU Parliament uh, highlighted uh, in uh, its uh, uh, September uh, resolution on medicine uh, shortages uh, that the EU must take action uh, to, to address its dependency on EU uh, plasma for the manufacture of PD and PS. We see that the Commission is one on the same line on its EU pharmaceutical strategy with its commitment to the accessibility of medicines, reduction of medicines shortages and securing strategic uh, uh, autonomy. In addition, the EU Commission very recently launched uh, a public consultation for an impact assessment to start the revision of the EU blood and tissue and cells legislations. The revision of these legislations can provide an opportunity not only to update the legislation to align with technological advancement, but also to address Europe's vulnerability as to its plasma collection. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I shall pick up some of those points that you make in our discussion with the speakers during the rest of the round table. Thank you once again for your welcome. Uh, and now as, as we move into the working session of this round table, uh, Allow me perhaps just to make one thing clear uh, about myself. I'm a journalist and I'm conscious of the many aspects of the debate on plasma and the very many diverse points of view about sourcing and transforming plasma into medicines. But as a journalist, I, I take no sides in this. I'm just hugely sympathetic to the interests of the patients in need of these products. I should be listening, therefore, with great interest to the analysis and recommendations from our experts and asking questions as we go along. Uh, also, if you'll permit me, given the complexity of today's subject, perhaps I must, I, I might just briefly explain up front exactly what we're talking about with plasma. It's a, plasma is, is a key element of blood. I mean, many of you already know this, but some of you may not have, I should promise to be brief on this. 55% of the total volume of blood is plasma. It's the clear straw colored liquid portion of blood that remains after the red blood cells and the white blood cells and the platelets and other cellular components have been removed. It can be obtained from donors. It can only be obtained from donors attending, uh, and some of them are attending specialized centers where a ferrocyst equipment allows it to be drawn directly from the donor, which is known as source plasma. And that takes about an hour. It can also be obtained by separation from whole blood connected, uh, collected by classic transfusion services, that's called recovered plasma. Uh, that sort of blood donation takes about 15 minutes, can be done three or four times a year. Plasma can be donated with a ferrocyst 
much more often than that. The plasma is then fractionated, that's when its components are separated out for processing into treatments to be used in a wide variety of specific conditions, as uh, Simona was saying, from immunodeficiency to hemophilia. Now, after this clarification, let's turn to our real experts who will learn, uh, well, they'll tell us something of the, the growing impact of plasma on therapy, and particularly on new therapies, and of the many technical and cultural and policy factors that influence its provision. Let's turn to the first of them. Uh, Dr. Nizar Maloui of the Necker University Hospital in Paris. He's a pediatrician who's specialized in primary immunodeficiencies for 15 years. Dr. Necker, welcome to you. Please give us a physician's perspective on plasma-derived medicinal products and the related opportunities and challenges faced by physicians like you in Europe. Dr. Necker, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for uh, uh, the PPTA uh, for organizing this uh, very important meeting. So as you said, I'm a pediatrician working in the field of uh, primary immune deficiency. So primary immune deficiency patients um, have a, a high burden of their disease um, because of infections. Um, so as I said, um, the, the patients with PID, primary immune deficiency, um, uh, suffer from infections, autoimmunity, autoinflammation, cancer, allergy, and uh, immunoglobulin um, um, uh, is the major mainstay treatment as a replacement therapy of their lack of antibodies, leading to uh, the symptoms and the comorbidities that have uh, highlighted. And this is a treatment that for which there is no alternative. There is basically no alternative for uh, patients with primary immune deficiencies who need immunoglobulin replacement therapy for their uh, uh, lifelong treatment. And the WHO has um, uh, ascribed uh, uh, PID as uh, one of the major uh, uh, condition uh, for um, immunoglobulin uh, 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 distribution in case of, uh, of shortages as we are currently living, which is not uh, a new topic, but definitely uh, is a topic that we see more and more frequently and with the COVID-19 situation will probably be, uh, we are facing uh, uh, another, uh, an, another stage of, uh, of these uh, shortages at the worldwide level. So um, um, we, uh, we, need, we need to make sure that uh, uh, patients are not limited in their access to health and to their treatment. Um, many patients, especially during the COVID-19 uh, in many EU countries, have been switched to um, um, a subcutaneous home treatment because of, you know, in order to avoid these patients to be exposed to the, to the virus, uh, upon them coming to the hospital at the day, uh, day hospital to receive their IV infusion. But that came with some, you know, an increase of tension into, um, you know, providing uh, uh, the sub-QIG by the companies and the pharmacists. Current, con 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 sorry, at the same time, there was a drop in blood and plasma collection at the worldwide level and uh, especially in the, in, the, in the US, but also in the EU. And uh, uh, we are, we've, we've already seen uh, signals of decreased levels of IG products in some countries. So clearly the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need of evidence-based decision-making and collaboration across all stakeholders uh, 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 at the international uh, level. Uh, and uh, thank you very much in the meantime for your uh, initial setting of the scene there. I'd now like to uh, provide an overview of the supply situation from Matthew Hotchcook, who's the president of the Marketing Research Bureau that specializes in analyzing and forecasting data on plasma collection, supply, fragmentation right around the world. Uh, Matthew knows the subject from the inside since he used to work in the industry now he's uh, one of the key guys in producing 
figures on it. So Matthew, please update us on the latest supply situation and particularly as it affects Europe. Thank you, Peter. And thank you to the organizers, the PPTA, and um, this is Simona Bonafé for the, uh, for the invitation to, to share some of the figures uh, that uh, my company collects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just brief um, explanation for the audience of where much of this data comes from. It comes, comes from a, a lot of legwork that uh, myself and others uh, who work uh, for for me and the company uh, collect on a daily basis from government sources and company sources, et cetera. So you'll see a lot of these figures uh, for the European market, particularly as well as global on plasma collections and immunoglobulin usage, which uh, I call IG usage in the presentation. But the plasma use for fractionation is collected globally, but as this pie chart on the left shows, it is by no means equally balanced. Um, and uh, North America, which is over 99% of the United States, uh, collects uh, over two thirds of the global plasma use for fractionation. Uh, the focus here, Europe, collects 14% based on numbers from last year. And uh, I'll get into what's changed in 2020 because the coronavirus pandemic has caused differences. But um, you know, this is the is the is the kind of the baseline we see. That's not at all. Uh, distributed equally based on either population or, as I'll show you later, on usage of the products. And so uh, this chart shows, again, the plasma needed for immunoglobulins in blue for each country and the plasma collected in that country in orange. Um, click once again. The, uh, the four countries with public and private, they all have a surplus of several hundred thousand liters extra of plasma that plasma is being made into products and sent, in often cases, to the poor countries on the right and others in Europe that all have deficits. Next again. Uh, the four countries on the right, uh, four major uh, European countries, three of them in the European Union, have a deficit. Um, in the case of France, over 1.6 million liters plasma deficit. Um, I, I just wanted to point out that this is not a Venn diagram because there is no overlap between the two. There is no country in Europe that has both private and public plasma freezes, which also has a deficit of plasma. Um, all of them that, that have both uh, operating systems in their country have a surplus. And, and, and I, while I don't show every European country here, I, I can tell you all the other major European countries, Belgium, um, Netherlands uh, and uh, Sweden, they would have a deficit as well. So it's pretty clear uh, to me uh, which countries have figured out a system to collect enough for their, for their patients uh, if, if we look at it that way. So just to conclude, uh, I think I showed uh, very clearly the US is the world's dominant and main supplier of plasma. And when it comes to Europe, the, um, the, the plasma about almost 40%, is coming from the US and this coronavirus pandemic, COVID-19, has exacerbated the problem of uh, reliance on other regions. The plasma, as the US, has uh, had a drop this year. Um, going forward, I think if this pandemic uh, subsides in 2021, I think you will see the US plasma collection return to growth. But if fundamentals don't change, which means if either demand doesn't keep increasing as uh, Dr. Malawi said it's likely to in Europe, or plasma doesn't grow faster in Europe. The deficit for European usage of IG versus plasma collected in Europe is going to increase. And this is going to be meaning more and greater reliance on the United States for plasma. If change, fundamentals don't change, then finally, diversification of plasma sources is increasingly imperative, and that would require more plasma to be collected in Europe in addition to other regions. So thank you for the moment. Now with that very helpful background on, on demand and supply of plasma, we can now move on to look at how plasma is seen by patients, regulators, producers, policymakers, and donors. Um, and I'll start by thanking the organizers uh, for the kind invitation and, and Mrs. Bonafé for hosting uh, this very important um, event. Next slide, please. 
So um, as uh, you would have seen uh, from, from my first slide, I'm the executive director of IMPOPI, uh, which stands for International Patient Organization for Primary Immunodeficiencies. And our organization essentially represents national associations of patients everywhere in the world and quite obviously uh, in the EU. So when we reflect, ref, uh, reflect about primary immunodeficiencies and how, um, where we stand today, the first thing to say is that they represent a substantial group of rare disorders with over 430 types of primary immunodeficiencies identified uh, to this day. They affect the immune system of patients and uh, they vary in severity. So they go from uh, being life impairing conditions to life threatening, very severe conditions. And a majority of our patients will need lifelong immunoglobulin replacement therapy to be able to live um, a, a normal life. Obviously, immunoglobulin therapies are made from plasma, as we've heard from uh, the previous presenters, and therefore uh, today's topic is, is very, very important to our community. Uh, the patients behind these slides, and essentially the slide was prepared by uh, not only IPOPI, but uh, in collaboration with uh, other patient organizations relying on PDMPs under the patient's platform called PLUS. Um, you can see that the points are not new. Um, you know, we were already calling for an increased supply uh, and free movement of safe and efficacious PDMPs uh, to meet patients' growing needs. And again, that links back to what I've said about the history of supply tensions and, and shortages to the point that today supply has really become the main safety issue for patients relying uh, on, on PDMPs. And so we encourage a free flow of PDMPs in the EU and globally uh, so that they can reach the patients who need them. Um, again, uh, bearing in mind that PDMPs are personalized treatments. We also call in for the development of guidelines, policy, and legislation to be based on fact, science, and experience. Um, certainly one fact today um, is that the world, including the EU, as we've heard, depends largely on compensated plasma donations, mainly coming from the US plasma donors. Uh, we also know that um, uh, countries that um, have uh, put in place a coexistence of the two sectors tend to collect more than others in the EU, as we've heard from the previous uh, presenters. And we also know from the European Medicines Agency that both PDMPs made from compensate plasma or voluntary and paid plasma donations have equivalent safety profiles. And so I, I really think that the needs of patients and care uh, is what needs to be driving uh, future legislation uh, in, in the area. So we also have called for uh, avoidance of wastage of plasma and particularly recovered plasma, developing and strengthening plasma phases programs whenever possible. We saw recent initiatives uh, from the European Commission uh, uh, for example, through the funding of plasma pheresis infrastructure uh, with a view to collect more convalescent uh, plasma during the COVID-19 pandemic through the emergency support uh, instrument uh, as very good signs that the, the, the EU is committed to work uh, on these programs. And I think an important uh, question would be to try to understand how this new infrastructure that is being funded by the Commission may actually be used uh, in the future, not only to collect convalescent plasma, but also to collect regular uh, plasma. Now, to make sure we've got time for Q&A at the end, I'm going to go straight on to our next speaker, who is uh, the first of our look at the questions of plasma through the eyes of the authorities. So let me invite uh, Dr. Luis Puig Rovira to take the floor. He is the medical director of the Blood and Tissues Bank in Barcelona and a key figure in the Catalan region's blood and plasma network. Uh, as Matthew pointed out in his presentation, I'm sure Dr. Puig will explain in more detail. In Spain, all plasma collection is through the nonprofit public sector, as is the case, in fact, in most EU member states. So Dr. Puig, please, Give us your view of plasma from your perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your invitation to participate in this in very interesting meeting about plasma and PDMPS. I will present the reality of my country and the perspective for the, for the near future. 
Uh, next slide, please. In this slide, I explain or I show you the Spanish scenario. Spain is a country with 46 million inhabitants, is divided in 17 autonomous communities, and uh, each one with a broad bank with different managing uh, models. Each broad bank established their own objectives and strategies. Their activity is very variable between 10,000, the little one, or the small one, blood bank, to 250,000, the biggest one. The global quantity of plasma to PDMPS is uh, 382,000 liters of plasma and this is the sufficiency in uh, the percentage of sufficiency of different proteins 39 percent uh, the icg albumin 56 percent factor uh, 8 51 and factor 9 57. next slide please bst Blood and tissue bank is the only blood bank for the 7.5 million inhabitants in Catalonia. In this table, you can see our activity related to plasma and PDMPS. During the last six years, we have increased the quantity of plasma volume from uh, PDMPS. Mm, uh, and also we have increased the production of immu uh, IgG. But the increase of uh, IgG use is much, much more uh, important than the production. For the reason, the percentage of sufficient has decreased uh, to 50% in 2040 to 38% in 2019. With this quantity of plasma, we are uh, self-sufficient in factor 9, factor 8, and alpha-1 antitrypsin, and quite uh, sufficient in albumin. Our level is 90%. All these questions are reasonable, but really it's necessary to increase the quantity of plasma to obtain more uh, ICG. Our objective in Catalonia is to be sufficiency in the 50% of IgG needs. This is about 319,000 uh, grams in a short period of time. To obtain this uh, quantity of this protein is necessary to get 87 liters of plasma and doing around 54,000 plasma pheresis. At that moment, we perform about 20, 25 plasma pheresis per year. If I consider all Spain, we need more than 117,000 uh, plasma pheresis. Our, uh, this is our plan to obtain more and more plasma next year. First one is to increase the information and social visibility. There are a lot of people who don't know that it's possible to give plasma. Look for the complicity of authorities and other social personalities. Have plasma donation centers near the population and also use the mobile units to be near the people who want to give plasma. Facilitate the transport of the donors and provide public transport tickets or parking. It's necessary to say thanks to the donors, but maybe also uh, give little give uh, to the to these donors. We think that it's in necessary a personal recon recognition and also organize social events in order to increase the interest of the people to give plasma. And also it's necessary to think about the donor safety. So this is an example of a regional approach uh, because of the way Spain is organized. And I'm sure there's some interesting comments we can uh, urge you to explore in relation to that. Uh, 
I'm going to talk now, though, turn to instantly to uh, a representative of another authority, a national authority, the uh, Austrian Ministry of Health, Department for Pharmaceuticals and Medical Devices, Blood, Tissue and Transplantation, represented here by Martina Brixis-Zulega. Thank you very much for being here, Madam Brixis-Zulega. Uh, as has been pointed out now, I think you're all clear about that, uh, in contrast to Spain and many other member states, plasma collection in Austria is performed by a mix of public and private sector centers, uh, as is the case also in Germany, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, as Matthew Hotchkin noted earlier. But I will let Mrs. Brixelega tell you more of that. So please, Martina, give us your views. So what challenges do we see at the ministry that's responsible for the supply of blood products? On the one hand, it's a challenge uh, to ensure the supply of the patients with plasma products and um, thus to have enough uh, plasma for production of pharmaceuticals. And on the other hand, to secure the supply with other blood products at the same time. And currently we are facing with covalescent plasma. And this places us, I think, in the situation that the potential donors in Austria would be important for both for plasma donation and whole blood donation. And with differences, um, especially that in Austria, the plasma donation for pharmaceutical production is carried out by the private sector. So uh, by profit organizations that pay a compensation. Um, whilst the whole blood donation and uh, most of the covalescent plasma donation for patients' care, so direct patients' care, are carried out by non-profit organizations, um, the, uh, the public sector, such as the Austrian Red Cross, and they do not pay um, direct expenses or compensations. And it's all um, with the knowledge that the voluntary and unpaid uh, blood donation at the Red Cross is, the, is our central pillar of the nationwide supply of the whole blood. But I have to say, um, nevertheless, this coexistence works in Austria very well at the moment. So last but not least, the current pandemic situation has also caused some uncertainties in the plasma donation area in Austria. Basically, I think there is no single solution that can be applied equally to all countries. Um, there's just an overview of our approaches. And I think the factor that influences our donation system the most, and um, I think that in, it's in a positive uh, sense, is the fact that Austrian culture is a culture of solidarity and cohesion and support and um, helping other people is very important to us. Another essential point, very important point, is that we, um, we used to have um, personal and direct contact and cooperation with the relevant stakeholders. Um, from the blood sector as well as uh, from the plasma sector. Um, so we have the um, representatives of the plasma sector and representatives of the whole blood donation sector in our National Blood Commission. Uh, and this commission advises the minister. And in my experience is that the ministry has an open exchange with the stakeholders. And I think that's very important to have. Um, and another point is in the same way that uh, we involve and, and listen to um, stakeholders and inform them, that, them about important decision, decisions from our ministry. And it is also important to create awareness uh, of the need for supply and how everyone can contribute to it. Uh, Stefan van der Spiegel, uh, who is uh, from the European Commission, Dr. Stefan van der Spiegel, Head of Health Information and Substances of Human Origin in the European Commission's Health Department. Uh, he will, I'm sure, put plasma issues into the context of the recently announced European pharmaceutical strategy and the revision of the blood products rules and, of course, the response to the COVID pandemic and related issues of shortages. So, Dr. van der Spiegel, over to you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Peter, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks again uh, for inviting us, and, and thanks in particular to um, MEP Bonafé and, and uh, MEP Luena for um, bringing us together here on this uh, important topic. So indeed, uh, as Peter said in my uh, coming five to 10 minutes, I, I just would like to briefly present our views and latest activities here at um, uh, in the European uh, Commission, which uh, in particular entail the plans uh, to revise the tissue and blood legislation and also uh, the pharmaceutical strategy, of course. Um, it's maybe upfront uh, important to recall, as uh, Peter did a bit uh, with the frame in the beginning, that um, the collection donation and testing steps of plasma fall under the blood legislation at the EU level, while the further manufacturing and then the distribution and putting it on the market fall under the pharmaceutical legislation. That's why you always have to look uh, from an EU legislative perspective uh, through a double um, pair of glasses uh, to this sector. Because that legal framework for the blood sector is a bit older, it dates back to 2002. So we wanted to see if it's still fit for purpose and if it also um, realized its objective of Im improving safety quality. And I have no side on that, but actually the good news is that it, uh, the safety quality is quite good for um, blood tissue cell uh, therapies. Nevertheless, there are a couple of shortcomings identified that we uh, were really need to look at and that are now on our more political agenda and I think the first one here that's very there are five key shortcomings uh, identified and the first one that I, I want to present here at first is, is the one actually the last one that we in the report but um, important for today is, is that actually it, it really uh, highlights that there is a, um, a concern on, on dependency in Europe from the US for having sufficient plasma to manufacture plasma-derived medicinal products for our EU citizens. And actually, if you look at the global scale and the MRB data were presented before, the, 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 the global population is actually highly dependent on, this, on the collection uh, in the US from a small, uh, limited part of the po world population. Next. Um, so in the... Last uh, weeks, uh, the Commission has decided a follow-up step on those uh, shortcomings uh, that were identified um, in the evaluation. And that follow-up step will be the, the revision of the legislation which goes hand in hand with an incept, inception impact assessment. So we need, of course, to assess possible measures that can be proposed to address this um, concerns uh, and here in particular for the for the supply concerns there were uh, there's measures that are proposed related in particular to to the monitoring so that we have a better monitoring on where the um, a view on, on where the different substances come from and, and go to and also we can, we can have early signals if there are shortages uh, expected and then also uh, possibilities for emergency uh, supply measures are considered in there that was in the legal framework. Beside, I also wanted to bring you a couple of um, actions that we laid out together with our colleagues in the Council of Europe and the European Director of Quality of Medicine. With them, we organized uh, last year a symposium on uh, plasma supply. And it was a really, I think, a first and, and a good um, opportunity to bring all the actors together in, in one big room. Uh, not just Commission European Council, but also the member state. And then, of course, on, on the next side. Next, please. Yeah, also manufacturers, blood establishment and collectors, patient associations, donor associations, and professional societies. So the doctors uh, that are using these therapies. And um, that was very valuable because in the end, a problem like this, where you want to um, get more plasma, you cannot just fix that with legislation. What you need is actions by all the actors in that chain from donor to recipient and also, of course, with the authorities that oversee that uh, chain. Uh, so all those actors need to be engaged and uh, everybody has to take um, some part of the responsibility and take some part uh, of the actions and that can, so across those chain and that is as well public actors as, as private actors. Um, if you would look, and I'm not going to go in detail here, but you you see there's a, a whole list of different set of recommendations here that were brought forward. Uh, they cover 
monitoring actions, uh, facilitating, make it, making the legislation um, more um, fluid, uh, also the interaction between those two frameworks, BLOTS and Pharma, to make that more fluid. But there's also measures on, um, on actually optimal use. And, and it was very interesting to see uh, in, as first presentation, the presentation by uh, Dr. Malawi, on uh, how the, the doctors and friends are looking into the best use for, for, the, for the therapies. So the, uh, there is really a need for all actors to, to contribute and, and, and do part of this uh, work if we want to come to a solution to have sufficient plasma for our patients uh, in the EU. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Uh, covering a, a lot of ground uh, very comprehensively there. We're in the classic situation, of course, of having excellent speakers covering such a wide range of topics that our time is starting to become a bit pressing. So I'm going to, we'll come back, I'm sure, with some questions to you all. But I'm going to move straight on to Michael Fuhr, because none of this plasma we're discussing would be available without donors. Human donation is the only source for it. Uh, and it's a great pleasure, therefore, to be able to introduce you to one of the people who choose to offer their plasma. Michael Fuhr from Berlin, who is here just as a private citizen to talk of his experience. So welcome, Mr. Fuhr, and thank you for taking part. Give us, please, a, a brief overview of your experience. Uh, I donate approximately every two weeks, but max for about 30 times a year. Mm -hmm. And do you have, you said you talked about doing it with other friends and so on. Uh, do you have a lot of sort of friends and acquaintances who uh, are doing this with you and, and have you got a lot of friends who know about the fact that you're doing it is it a sort of matter of public record as it were you're, or you, you run a restaurant do your clients know that you uh, are a frequent uh, plasma donator donor as well sure sure uh, first of all my one friend peter and me we came uh, first time to, to the donation center which about nearly six years ago what i said yeah and after that more people joined us yeah uh, one of the things that's come up over and over again in this discussion this afternoon is this question of awareness. Uh, you became aware of it, as you said, in your own particular way. Uh, although it's obviously you've got a very personal, direct connection with this, I imagine you're also aware of the broader picture. Do you feel that there is a level of awareness in, well, in the places you live and work, or indeed at a more broad level in the country itself, about the merits the value of plasma donation and the eventual use that it's put to or do you think that more needs to be done to raise awareness there is for sure the way there is for sure the awareness but i think there must be more published yeah how much do we need it what the people for cancer or, or people have burned skins or whatever there's a lot of different things you need plasma for yeah and I think we should need more advertising for it. Thank you very much indeed for coming along with that personal testimony. I'm going to introduce rapidly now Matthias Gessner. Thank you. Uh, he is uh, moving from a donor to the collector. It's a logical step to take in our review of plasma. Matthias is the chair of the European Plasma Alliance, which brings together 11 European private sector plasma collectors. He's also a senior executive in Takeda and consequently is well placed to give us an industry perspective on the situations and challenges of plasma collection in Europe. Please give us your view of the situation. Thanks Peter for the introduction and yeah, thanks Kit for giving me the opportunity to speak here, thanks to the organizers. Um, if I could have the first slide, just uh, a very brief overview about the European Plasma Alliance. So we are an uh, alliance which is representing actually 10 uh, I, I did the count again, it, it's, it's 10 European plasma sector collectors and uh, our organizations, uh, our members are active in uh, 140 centers currently in, in Germany, Austria, Czech Republic and Hungary in uh, collection of plasma, compensated plasma collection. And as you can see there, in 2019, 2.9 million liters were collected in, in these centers. So if, if you look at the numbers that Matthew showed in the beginning, that's about 30% of the, the plasma available in 2019 or collected in, in Europe in 2019. So quite a substantial uh, contribution to the overall availability of plasma in, in Europe. The question, what can we do? And, and I think that's the part where I 
think that the, the private plasma collectors and the compensated plasma donation can really make a, a difference uh, if we are willing to, to extend this to more countries in, in Europe. It could be a key to provide sufficient plasma for Europe. So given the, the growing clinical need on one side and the already now significant reliance on US plasma and the risk of supply disruption that we've realized now with the COVID crisis, in order to increase the, 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 uh, the, the volume of plasma collected, uh, we need to make changes on the EU level, but especially also on national policy level, because largest part, the legislation, the regulations around uh, plasma and blood collection is, is done nationally. So the first and most important step would be to go to the establishment of plasmapheresis programs. This has already been, been asked also by Johan. And to start outreach campaigns towards plasma donors in, in, in an uh, approach to increase awareness. Because even if plasma collection is available, in many cases, people are not aware of this possibility and how important it is to, to donate plasma. We heard about the protection of donor health, which of course uh, is an important or paramount uh, topic in, in collection, in blood and plasma collection. And regulations in this sense uh, need to be based on scientific data uh, and should of course uh, have the goal of protecting donor health to a maximum extent. But at the same time, I, I think what we also need to realize is that we need to recognize plasma donors for their contribution to society. Uh, very often my, my impression is that uh, blood donation is, is seen as the kind of, of first line donation and plasma donors are a kind of, it's a kind of second type of donation. And I think we need to, to change here the recognition. Both donations are really very much important. Blood and plasma donation and really depends on the disease that uh, you personally have which one of the uh, of these two uh, donation types is the real more important for a patient personally. What we need, and uh, that's a, a larger topic, I think, but uh, what we can see from the uh, from the map that I showed you, we need compensation for inconveniences and, and effort of plasma donors. Plasma donation is a lot more effort compared to blood donation. It is more frequent. It takes more time. And it's clear that there is a need to offer compensation for this additional effort. Otherwise, donors will not be able to sustain the longer term activities like Marcel is doing for six years uh, in, in a very intense program. And we already have a, uh, an example here looking at Article 12 of the Tissues and Cells Direct. And then last point I would make here is that in order to, to have meaningful regulations, around blood and uh, plasma, we need to, to have clear regulations and clear definitions, specifically around the fact what is plasma and also around uh, the topic of plasma donor compensation. So on the next slide, in addition to Marcel, I wanted to show you two plasma donors. And at this point, I would like to say many thanks to those who regularly go and donate plasma in one of the plasma centers. They make it possible that we have the PDMPs available for patients. Thank you very much, Matthias. We could go on for hours, but we're not allowed to. So I'm going to bring this to a, a conclusion uh, before I introduce our closing remarks from our co-host here in the parliament. Uh, We've conducted the last couple of hours, really, we looked at many of the realities of this plasma collection and transformation and use. And we've found many common contentions that emerge. There's evidently some growth in demand. There's a complexity in the provision. There are current gaps in sufficiency. There are risks to the future. Some solutions enjoy some wide support. There's raised awareness, I think everyone agrees about the need for raising awareness among donors, better monitoring of supplies, clearer definition of terms such as basic, uh, uh, terms, basic terms like blood uh, and plasma, distinct regulatory frameworks that reflect the identified needs and continued efforts to overcome the COVID related challenges as well to see maybe the best solutions from that integrated into future rules. Uh, but there are at the same time very evident nuances of analysis. 
Uh, there's questions over the scale of genuine unmet need, uh, questions over the appropriateness of prescribing, nuances, quite big nuances over differences of approach to collection, whether it should be public or private sector or coexistence, whether it should be compensated or purely voluntary. Uh, there are discernible differences and indications of concern on some issues from different stakeholders. Uh, and that's not surprising. It's only to be expected in, in such a major topic with so many different interests at stake. Uh, on some of these issues, there's already an agreed body of evidence. And on, on others, the evidence being offered is still being assessed and will need to continue being assessed. So at present, a comprehensive solution to all the challenges is just not within reach. I hand the floor to our co-host for the formal closing of this roundtable, Spanish Socialist MEP Cesar Luena, who is a uh, vice chair of the influential European Parliament Committee responsible for health. So thank you, Senor Luena, and from me, goodbye. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we have seen today a strong commitment from patients, donors, physicians, industry and policy makers to engage in a dialogue to collect more plasma in Europe. Thanks to the presentations and panel discussions, we have learned about the importance of plasma therapies and the supply of safe and high quality plasma. My main conclusion from your presentations is that more urgently than ever, more plasma needs to be collected across the European Union. This must start now without any delay to ensure that patients get the therapies they need to survive. Policymakers at EU and national level must take a strong action and modernize legal frameworks and policies to generate concrete effects. Change to frameworks will be made based on scientific evidence and facts. To increase the plasma collection, we need an uh, approach focused on donors and patients and the collaboration between all stakeholders, public sector and private sector organizations. If there is no plasma, there is no medicine to the patients who need it. I would like to demand a call for action. EU and national policies must facilitate an increased plasma collection by establishing dedicated plasma collection programs and coordinate awareness outreach campaigns towards plasma donors in all EU member states. Distinguishing between whole blood for transfusion and plasma for manufacturing PDMPs. And third, considering more regulatory flexibility to optimize plasma collection in Europe. As my colleague, Simona Borafe mentioned earlier the EU pharmaceutical strategy and the uh, revision of the blood and tissues and cell legislation represent a timely opportunity to ensure that sufficient plasma in collect in Europe, not only now, but also in the long term. I would like to thank the speakers and the moderator, Peter O'Donnell, and all the participants.